it is. Hello and welcome to RBCM at Home. My name is Kim Goff and I'm a learning program developer at the Royal BC Museum and I'm coming to you from my home on the traditional territories of Lekwungen speaking people in Esquimalt, BC. In this series, we talk with museum staff who've also been working at home during the pandemic. I'm sure that many people who have been watching this series do so for a bit of distraction, but I would be remiss not to address George Floyd, Black Lives Matter, and the protests that are taking place in the United States and around the world. Museums and the stories they tell about history are often the result of power and colonialism. In my own practice, I have been working at taking a more critical look at the role of museums than I did 20 years ago when I first started. But I acknowledge there's much more I can do to increase inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility in my programs and events. If you have suggestions or voices that you would like to share or you think should be amplified, please reach out to the museum or to me directly. There is a current project at the Royal BC Museum to collect and document history as it happens. And you can share your story and perspectives or even your photographs by emailing for our time at royalbcmuseum.bc.ca. But for right now, we are not collecting any physical objects. Speaking of objects, Today, I have the Senior Conservator of Collections Care and Conservation, Casey Root. The conservation team is going to be joining us all through the month to share practical tips for taking care of your home treasures. Today, Casey is going to talk to us about dolls. Welcome, Casey. Thank you, Kim. I see a small collection of dolls there with you. Are they all yours? Well, they're family dolls. These belong to my kids from the earliest ages. My kids are now in their 20s. They don't play with them so much anymore, but they're keepsake items for them. Some were collected on trips and travels, and others are your garden variety Barbie dolls. Um, a lot of them haven't survived the test of time or have been passed along to, to little ones that uh, are still enjoying their dolls. Sure. I myself wasn't a doll collector growing up, but I, I still have a couple of my teddy bears uh, <laughs> that were special to me when I was young. And because they're special to us, we tend to cuddle them and hold them or play with them. And I'm sure um, that is, can lead to some damage and things that are ongoing. And I think you've got some tips for us uh, on that today and a PowerPoint to share with us. So I'll ask you to share your screen, Casey, and okay. we can start. How did that work? Perfect, thank you. Shall I just go ahead? Yeah, you can jump right in. Okay, uh, so I meant to actually, before I got into the PowerPoint, maybe I'll do it at the end, but uh, shamelessly promote our book here that was published by one of the conservators at the Royal BC Museum. Her name is Colleen Wilson. She specializes in textile conservation although I think you can find her uh, about now climbing a ladder, dusting natural history specimens in our natural history gallery, getting, uh, getting the exhibits ready for opening on June 19th. So we're all uh, a little bit um, diverse in our backgrounds, and, but we are highly specialized too. So um, we, we work together pretty well as a team. Colleen published this, um, almost 20 years ago. It's a delightful read. It is a read. It's not a manual. It's, um, it's wonderfully written. Colleen has a great flair for words. And uh, so if you want to get a hold of this at, in the gift shop, or I believe it's online and on our website, then um, it, uh, it has everything from washing textiles to caring for um, uh, furs and feathers and plastic even, fans. It's got some wonderful illustrations and um, and actual photographs of the things that she's describing. It's got a little bit about pest controls. There, there's that carpet beetle that I was talking about just now. That's a varied carpet beetle that uh, can do a lot of damage to museum collections as well as your own. And of course the dreaded clothes moth that most of us are familiar with that tend to get into our woolens and sometimes our silk and other garments. So great book. And I think Colleen's going to be delivering one of these sessions uh, right at the end of the month. So you'll have a chance to hear directly from her. If you pre-read the book, you could probably even discuss something that you've read in there. 
So on to the topic of the day then, caring for dolls. And thanks so much for joining me today. I am not a doll expert. I am an objects conservator, so a bit of a generalist. I uh, know dolls from my personal life and I've worked in several museums with lovely doll collections. So over the past 30 years, I, I've gained a little bit of experience working with dolls. Dolls, of course, we talked a little bit about uh, the collection that I have here. Um, some of them, like the Barbie dolls, even within the Barbie doll collection of my kids, we, uh, we have those that are played with or were played with and those that you don't touch. And uh, the odd bar Barbie doll even in its collector's box. So there can be different approaches to the care of dolls depending on what their original use was. Um, dolls, some dolls, one would want to remain pristine or return to a pristine condition if something happened to them along the way. And um, other doll dolls are very well loved and show that love in so many ways. And uh, from the, for the most part, we don't want to erase that history of use and care and sometimes damage along the way. So uh, in terms of how we care for our dolls, there are different approaches and each doll uh, requires some careful consideration before we decide what we're going to do in terms of care for it. So I'm looking up at, there we go. I uh, just wanted to mention briefly the difference between conservation and restoration. And I put a little graphic up here that Brian Howard so, uh, so eloquently talked about on his website listed below there. Um, restoration at the top there uh, is something like having a, an old vintage bicycle and that is in poor shape and deciding that uh, the wheels are not in good condition anymore. So you're going to borrow a wheel or two off of a brand new bike and you might paint it in a fancy new color in a, a paint that is completely irreversible. You could never get it off again, but it's going to endure and maybe put a new seat on it because that old seat is, uh, is not doing the, the trick anymore. So that would be more of a restoration effort. Whereas when we're talking about conservation on the lower set of images there, you have the same bicycle and a conservator takes their magic paintbrush there and they might touch up the paint. We generally don't paint over top of the original paint. We use barrier coats and we try to use something that's reversible um, and we would try to source original parts. So if the seat needed to be replaced, we would try to find um, the appropriate leather um, and style of seat to uh, replace it so that the viewer knows that this bike did have a seat and this is what it looked like. And, um, and yeah, we might mostly clean it and touch it up all over, but we don't want the bike to look brand new. We want the, uh, the researcher or the visitor to our exhibits to appreciate what the bike would have looked like originally or when it was owned and used by somebody, probably in British Columbia being the provincial museum that we are. And a few notes of caution um, about hazardous materials in collections, and that uh, extends to doll collections, amazingly enough. But there can be some hazardous materials. Um, we worry a lot about in the museum about pesticide residues and things like uh, feathers and hair, uh, real human hair or otherwise, uh, can be treated with things that um, pesticides that contain heavy metals like arsenic, lead, and mercury. Uh, there may be the residues of those treatments still on the materials. We also worry about mold, especially with things that are uh, kept in our basements or attics for long periods of time and, and with our high humidity here on the west coast we do tend to deal with a lot of mold problems and that can be a real health problem. And then there's just things like rusty sharp pins and, and things. So do protect yourself when you're working with your antiquities um, because they may not be as safe as they once were. And then I wanted to mention the importance of documenting what you do when you're caring for your dolls. And examples are when we take a 
um, apron off of a doll and you undo the knot, well, it might be second nature to undo a knot and take the apron off because we're going to clean it or what have you. We'll talk about that later. But um, it's really important to get that apron back on the way that it came off. So if there was some special bow that was used with that particular doll um, that is in, uh, important to its history, then grab a quick cell phone picture or draw it out if you have a good hand at that. Um, but do try to document everything you do before you do it and, and maybe even after you do it if you want to keep a record of the beautiful work that you did. Um, documentation is key to everything that we do as conservators. And I wanted to stress that there are a lot of conservators in Canada and elsewhere. Um, you can usually find them through your local museum. You can also, uh, this last icon right here is the uh, Canadian Association of Professional Conservators, and they keep a list of conservators who work in the private sector, who you can con contract to help you out with a, a particular doll conservation project, or um, institutional conservators like myself. Uh, we dispense advice over the phone and sometimes even in person. So um, get it from the professionals and there will be no regrets. Ooh. Trying to advance, but it's not working. Hang on. There we go. Okay, so dolls, they're made out of a huge variety of materials. A lot of these you'd be familiar with, some you might not. Um, some of the earliest dolls were made out of wax, and uh, I'll show you an example of each of these types of dolls in just a minute. I pulled some from our collection at the museum. Um, but wax, uh, those, they were originally called poppets and, um, and generally weren't made for handling by children. They were, uh, they were figure dolls. Uh, we have porcelain dolls that uh, were common in Asia, and of course they're a, a glazed ceramic. And then bisque dolls, which were very popular and continue to be popular um, since the 1860s or so in Europe, and they are in unglazed ceramic. So they have more of a matte appearance and usually have hand-painted details on them. Uh, there's papier-mâché, which is a kind of glue and paper product uh, doll, and of course paper dolls, which uh, I hope that you've all had the pleasure of playing with. I know I loved mine when I was younger. Uh, composition dolls, or sometimes they're called compo dolls. And those, the heads and usually the hands and feet are made out of a mixture of glue and sawdust. So um, those were really popular in the 20th century in, in the United States. And there are leather dolls, dolls that are partly or sometimes all made out of leather, but often a soft white kid leather. And wooden dolls, sometimes they're jointed and sometimes they're solid. Uh, many of the folk art dolls are made entirely of wood, carved. Uh, plastics, of course, they, uh, they came to popularity around uh, the mid 20th century and that includes rubber. There are a lot of rubber dolls out there and they've become a real conservation problem for us. So we're, we're dealing with our plastics in our collection and I'll, I'll bet you are too. Uh, and then textiles, we have rag dolls and uh, knitted crocheted dolls and all sorts of fiber-based dolls. And those are always popular with, with the younger kids and tend to endure uh, rather than some of the more fragile porcelain and, and uh, composition dolls, which quite often uh, crack or are dropped and are broken. Um, and then I just wanted to mention too that dolls are almost always made out of more than one material. So they could be any mixture of these, these materials that I've talked about. Usually the um, head plate is made out of a hard material that can be um, decorated, painted, uh, very uh, intricately and then less detail quite often on the arms and legs and then sometimes the bodies are just a piece of stuffed textile or, or what have you because it's usually covered with uh, with clothing. So then you also have the clothing uh, part of dolls and the hair which can be a synthetic or even a real human hair and quite often that's the part of the doll that's in the worst condition. How are we doing, Kim? Everybody still with us? 
still here. We're about halfway through our time, Casey. Okay, thank you. So I was going to show you some of the dolls from our collection. Uh, of course, we don't have collection managers on site right now. They're, they're at home with this COVID-19 crisis. So I was lucky to have the permission of our collection manager for a modern human history collection, Paul Ferguson, who uh, passed me the keys to the cabinets to um, I can't, can't take them home with me, that would not work, but I was able to take them out and have them photographed um, yesterday so that um, I could share them with you. I wanted oh, thank to thank you for that, Casey, that's really nice. Yeah, no worries, it was fun. Um, there are some wonderful dolls in there and, and a huge number of examples, so I just tried to pick uh, one of each type of doll that I wanted to speak about. Uh, this being a wax doll, and I just put in a little inset of her face more close up. And you can see how the wax tends to form these networks of cracks and also suffers a lot from heat uh, deterioration, of course, being wax. So the wax dolls are very fragile and quite often don't last. So we're lucky to have this one. She looks like she's missing a little booty there and possibly an arm. And she's got some stains on her frock, but, um, but quite a lovely little doll. And this, I got two screens going here. I'm so tech savvy here because I've got some notes on one screen and then I've got you looking at the other screen. So if I get out of sync, just let me know. Um, but according to our catalog record, this is a Florence Nightingale doll that dates to 1914. So she is a good example of a porcelain doll. And you can see the little painted features on her face and she's got the porcelain hands and feet and a soft body. And she's got some lovely little clothes, nursing clothes that somebody has uh, fashioned for her. Porcelain dolls, of course, were, have been very popular over the, over the years and continue to remain popular. A lot of tourist type um, souvenirs are, are porcelain dolls. And then we have the Bisque dolls. And this is one that dates from our catalog record to 1905 to 1910. So she's a little sad looking. She's lost her lid, her, her hair has become detached, but that's something that's pretty, pretty easy to fix for us. So uh, a little bit of adhesive and we can get her hair right back in place. We quite often don't treat, uh, do a conservation treatment on collections unless there's a reason to, because this is the way that the doll came to our collection and we want to preserve what we were given when it arrived at the museum. But if there is a time that we want to put together an exhibit and it's appropriate, that might be the time that we would um, adhere the hair back to the head and um, bring the whole doll back to at least exhibit quality, not its original condition, but exhibit quality anyway. Casey, there's a question from one of our viewers on Facebook and she's wondering yeah. if when you've been examining any of these dolls, have you ever found something secretly hidden inside a doll? Mm, good question. Wouldn't that be lovely? Um, I haven't. I've uh, I found things secretly hidden inside of desk drawers and inside of bottles. And um, back when I, my favorite episode was when I worked in Saskatchewan at the Royal Saskatchewan Museum and we found a message in a bottle that was hidden inside the dome of the legislative buildings in Regina. And oh. And I had the privilege of extracting the message because it was very tightly rolled inside a very narrow necked bottle and they couldn't get the message out. So they uh, smartly took it over to the museum and as the conservator then uh, extracted the, the note and it was uh, just a lovely note from a Mason who had worked on the building of the legislature and uh, talked a lot about his family and his work on the legislature and the weather and the crops and it was it was quite a treat to know that I I was the first person to see that after so many years that it was locked away and that that person had had meant for somebody to find it someday so so uh, it was fun to share that wonderful to discover that voice from the past. Um, before we leave this image, and you were talking about hair, there's a question oh. about, um, this one is a Shirley Temple doll from about 19, the 1970s, and it's been in a trunk for decades. Her curls are flat on the back of her head. Can I, or should I, do anything to get them back to their original glory? 
I guess my first question would be why? Why do you want to get them back to her original glory? Now, right now, they're on the back of her head, as I'm hearing. So maybe she looks just fine from the front. And if you wanted to display her, bring her out and show her to people, it might be nice to make a little display box or even a display case that would go on your wall or some surface and nobody would ever see that flattened hair. And so from a, the perspective of a conservator, the less you do, the better. So in the process of regenerating those curls, which may be possible, um, we can do a lot of damage too. So my advice would be to do nothing if at all possible, um, but we, separate our treatments into mechanical and chemical treatments. And so a little bit of mechanical treatment as in a, a, a small comb or tweezers without tugging too much, you might try to at least smooth it in the parts that, that you can see from the front. Um, it really depends on what that hair is made of because if it's real hair or um, something that reacts a lot to moisture, you probably don't want to wash it. Uh, some of the synthetic hairs, you can uh, add uh, a little bit of water or some various lubricants too to, to tidy out the, ang the, the knots and perhaps encourage the, the curls back. But really to completely restore that hair, that's, that's a restoration. And there are people that do that. You can find them on the internet. And if that's what you wish for your doll as the custodian and, and owner of it, then you're perfectly well within your rights to, to have that work done. It's just not something that a conservator would do. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, paper dolls. We have a lot of paper dolls at the museum. This is one example of a paper doll from about 1930. Her name is Michelle. I noticed that all of the paper dolls in our collection or all the ones that I saw have names and they come with various wardrobes. And um, this is the area of paper conservation that I am not expert in. We have a paper conservator at the Museum and Archives. Her name is Lauren Buttle. And um, I would probably not touch this as an objects conservator. But you can see in this particular one here that somebody at some point has taped back on the arm of this lady when it, after it ripped off. So there is a really good example of why not to use tape on artifacts that um, any kind of pressure sensitive adhesive like that tends to leave a residue. And over time it turns dark and the tape carrier, the, the plastic part of it, in this case, it looks like it's a scotch tape kind of tape, um, will embrittle and fall off. And all you get, so then the, the thing breaks again and all you're left with is this nasty uh, adhesive stain, which we're fortunate uh, in that some, a paper conservator can probably reduce that staining, but you need very sophisticated techniques to do that. And it's not something I'd recommend doing at home. But I just caution you, Please don't use tape on your um, paper or any other artifacts that you have at home. Um, of course, these are sometimes made out of cardboard as well. Uh, most of the same principles apply. We didn't, that I could find, have a composition doll in the collection. And actually, I, I think we do have several of them in the collection. I just didn't have the time to properly identify them. So I grabbed this off the internet. So thank you, Spruce Crafts, for putting this up there. I thought these were two adorable little dolls. And the composition dolls do tend to crack and delaminate over time. You can see quite a bit of problem with this little, little one's foot and leg here. And a lot of abrasions on, on the head and they don't last terribly well. And that's mostly why they were replaced with the more hard, um, hard materials and plastics soon after. This is an example of leather dolls, of a leather doll. And usually the entire doll is not made of leather. I don't know anything about this doll. There wasn't any information that I could find in the catalog record. But just to give you an example, she's got jointed legs and, um, and she is made of leather. These parts, her torso, her legs, it's just the um, head and shoulder piece here and the hair that are made of another material. So um, she would be stuffed out possibly with natural materials or um, later on with, with a polyester or some kind of synthetic material. But they have a nice, I find a nice tactile feel to them. 
and she's um, she's obviously got a little bit of staining going on here and a, a broken shoulder here, but she's in pretty good condition. So if a doll is not abused too badly by its, its little one owner at some point, or sometimes adult owners don't necessarily treat their things that great, then, then uh, they, they can survive well. This is a wooden doll in our collection. And I put this up here because this is quite a curious wooden doll. It has been through the conservation lab a, a couple of times, I think. It was carved, I believe, between, uh, um, actually, I think the attribution is 1815 to 1920. So I don't know when it was made. That's a very long period of time. Um, the catalog record says that it was made in Germany. And there are a lot of old repairs on it. It's got some very strange repairs. It's got this one replacement arm here, which is a solid piece rather than what appears to be the original jointed arm. And it is actually an exact replica of the hand here. So she actually has two left arms. So we're not real fond of that repair. And then it also appears that her, uh, her legs these are just her, her thighs and she's missing her lower legs. So somebody's uh, attached the feet to the, to the upper legs and we are missing the lower legs on that one. So um, uh, a strange doll with a history of repairs. We keep all the old repair parts because they're part of the history of that doll. And also incidentally, um, a couple of our conservators worked on her head, which had some delaminating paint and they were able to lay down that that uh, flaking paint and uh, preserve what was left of, of her features on her head. So there is um, a slight connection, possible collection to, connection to Emily Carr and the fact that this doll may have appeared. It's very similar to one in, in one of her sketchbooks. So we think this may be an important part of our collection, but we have very limited information right now. So we would love it if the public um, a member of the public would say, oh, I know that doll, and, and bring in some more information. And that does happen um, quite frequently. So um, yeah, that's, that's I love I love the expression on that doll's face. It's, uh, there's a character to her, for sure. Okay, so we have about five minutes left or so, and a couple of questions to get to. So I'll let you, um, with that in mind. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Kim. Uh, I do have a lot more to say, so I better bomb through this. This is a, a little brownie doll uh, that was made, I think, in the 1980s and is made of acrylic fabric in the Philippines. And the smaller one above it is what we call an Izzy doll uh, that was made in 2003. And there's a great story. We have um, several of these Izzy dolls, and they were made... Uh, and given to Canadian UN troops to take overseas to give to children over there during uh, UN missions. And uh, the name comes from Mark Isfeld, whose mother made these dolls. And he unfortunately was killed in 1994 when uh, working in Croatia. But his mother still makes these dolls, uh, or at least that's what the catalog record says. And so they still go overseas to help traumatize children. And of course, this is a, a knitted doll. Then we have plastic dolls and we have a cutie doll here and, and a little rubber molded baby boy doll. The cutie doll dates to the 1920s, made in Japan, and is probably made of cellulose nitrate, which is one of our really fugitive plastics that tends to deteriorate quite rapidly. And you can see how distorted the little baby boy doll too. The rubber does not last well, even in the dark, in the best collection preservation conditions. And he, he does have some pretty warped limbs here and, um, and missing fingers. He's, he's not long for this world. So that's, that's very sad. Not a lot we can do for these dolls. So I'll just whiz through the rest of this then. Um, the first thing you wanna do when you're caring for your dolls is examine them closely, look for labels and maker's marks, and um, maybe check for pictures on eBay and um, contact a local museum curator. So the curator knows is the specialist in the history of your dolls, whereas the conservator is a specialist in how to care for the physical condition of your doll. So uh, take a look at um, what your doll is made of and its history. Conservators would examine the doll. Sometimes we use microscopes and 
even x-rays, other high-tech tools to identify the, the, um, the materials that the doll is made of and the methods of manufacture. And we try to understand, hmm, I see what's happening. I'm over top of my own writing here. Um, the history of use and deterioration, and we document what we've learned. Documentation is so important to us, and it should be to you too, when you're taking care of your collections. And then we consider treatment if necessary. For you at home, uh, there's a picture here of a fabric doll, and you can see when the coat is pulled back, this was the original color of the legging, and the part that was exposed to light is almost white now because it was on display for quite a while. So light damage, it's cumulative over time, and it's completely irreversible. So try to keep your dolls away from direct sunlight for sure, and regular light as much as possible. Keep them away from heat sources like heat registers, and um, control the humidity. Basements and attics are not the best place to store anything, but I understand you have to. Casey, this is a, a caregiver question, and it comes from Evelyn, who's watching on Facebook. And she's asking, is it best to store the dolls with their clothes on or store the clothes separately? Ah, good question. And we have a lot of our dolls with clothes stored on and separately. Um, my preference would be to keep everything together because it's so easy to separate the clothing, the parts from the original. So if the clothing is in stable condition, if it's on the doll already, I would keep it on the doll. And that way there's no question about how it went on the doll originally, what went with which doll. Um, it should be okay, except in rare circumstances to um, store them dressed. Um, so also we watch out for insects, those carpet beetles and clothes moths, and uh, we use enclosures for storage and display. Just watch with your plastic dolls in particular because the plastics tend to off gas after a while, especially when they're starting to deteriorate over time. So um, try not to seal them in a box, just a tray or an open box would be better than a sealed box. And, uh, and avoid wood and cardboard boxes because they tend to off gas a lot of acidic vapors that uh, can discolor and, and actually contribute to the deterioration of many different materials. So in cleaning, I wanted to show you a trusty vacuum nozzle. And we generally use a screen over top of our, our nozzle to make sure, just in case we vacuum up that, that bead or a piece of a doll that we didn't mean to, it's saved here on the tip of our nozzle. So always vacuum through a piece of cheesecloth or a screen on the end of your vacuum nozzle. And that's the best way to clean most dolls in their clothes. Um, and actually, I think I had a brush. If you cannot actually contact the doll, but use a little paintbrush to, can you see that? Um, to direct the dust and dirt towards the vacuum nozzle. Yes, we you, can see that, looks good. Good. Um, you can hand wash some textiles, and I brought my trusty light product here, but there are other hand washing detergents that are gentle enough to use on textiles. I would just caution you to first test um, in a really inconspicuous spot on your doll to make sure that the dyes don't bleed on your doll. So I brought my glass of water and my, my little uh, dropper here. So take just one little tiny drop of water on an inconspicuous part of your textile and then blot it with a piece of tissue or blotting paper and see if any of that dye comes off because you don't want your dyes to run and that'll really mess up your textiles. Um, for the actual doll itself, you can use Q-tips. That's what we use a lot of in conservation. And so you can just use a little bit of water on a Q-tip and you can introduce the, the detergent as well if you need to, to remove greasy dirt. But if you do have detergent in the water, remember to rinse it afterwards because you don't want to leave residues in your uh, doll clothing or on the dolls themselves because that just attracts more dirt and stains over time. We use cosmetic sponges. You can buy them at any drugstore. And they are look just little wedges of rubber that you can um, take over the surface of, of a doll and that will take up a lot of greasy dirt and smudges and things. It'll, it'll really brighten up the, uh, the surfaces. 
And if you do find an infestation with your dolls, you might want to freeze them. So we freeze things at minus 20 Celsius for at least 48 hours if we uh, suspect that they're infested with, with um, moths or beetles. So you can talk more to a conservator about that if you have that concern. Casey, is my freezer at home cold enough to do that? Yeah, if you can check the thermometer or the specs on your freezer, not all freezers are, but okay. many are. So, so I would check. Um, and in terms of repairing, you want to preserve old repairs like we have on that wooden doll that I showed you, uh, because that's part of the history of your doll. And save and label all parts that you might take off or store separately, that's super important. Um, leave mechanical parts such as little voice boxes or even the sleepy eyes to, to the professionals because you can get into a lot of trouble unless you know exactly what you're doing with those. If you do decide that you have to adhere something back together or consolidate it a little bit, these are really the job of conservators, but um, in speaking with a conservator at a museum, you might want to try some of these yourself and just make sure whatever you do, it is reversible because uh, some of these products change over time. They darken and they become brittle and they look horrible. So you want to be able to take it off when necessary. And yeah, mend textiles. If you have the skill, there's a lot of great skilled um, textile artists and seamstresses around. So um, just try and use a thread that's less strong than the original textile. So if you're talking about an old degraded uh, cotton or um, uh, quite often cotton, you might want to use a silk thread that is more likely to break than the uh, original fiber. Um, uh, so we talked about sorting out tangled hair. And I just threw in there uh, 3D printing because it's kind of fun that if you have a missing part, you might be able to find a way to 3D print a new one. That's something that we're just trying to get into in conservation. Um, display and storage. Am I almost done here? Almost done. One more slide after this. Um, so you can look for supplies in online, online or in craft stores. And I have uh, some doll stands that I use for my dolls and you can pick these up. They're very cheap. They're nice for display of your dolls. Also nice to display them inside of uh, nice cabinets and such that keep the dust and dirt off. We talked about uh, light and pests and cardboard containers. Uh, Acid-free tissue is great for wrapping your dolls in and this is just a little bit here but uh, you can get it at Walmart or wherever and just make sure it's acid-free otherwise it can stain your dolls. And this is especially important if you are storing plastic dolls for a long time because it will absorb some of the acidic vapors that come off the plastic dolls and uh, help them to survive. And it will also stain a dark color if you've got a real problem going on in there. So it gives you an indication that there's something uh, deteriorating with your plastic doll. Um, you can frame your paper dolls. That's always nice. And um, you can, cons sorry, just to move back, you can consider storing your plastics in the freezer. Uh, some plastics do better in the freezer than others. Don't freeze your wax dolls, uh, but that will uh, help them to last longer if it's an heirloom and you want it to survive. And finally, if you're done with your dolls, you can't help them anymore or you'd like to share them with the rest of the world, they're sitting in your attic and they're, they're being neglected, which happens to all of us. Um, if they're really well documented and relate to the history of British Columbia, you can talk to a curator at the Royal BC Museum through our website. You can find the contact information and, uh, and consider donating them. And as well, smaller community museums are quite often interested in um, regionally uh, uh, used or manufactured dolls and um, do what I did about six months ago is I rounded up a whole lot of dolls that were sitting neglected in my basement and I brought them over to the women's transition house and there are, there are groups that would love to, to uh, marry your, your dolls up with some children who, would, who are in need. Uh, some dogs, dolls can be sold, they have some market value, and that's another good reason not to uh, play around them, with them too much in terms of uh, restorations. Uh, you can talk to antique stores about that. Um, just wanted to say, remember that your old tattered doll does carry a story, and uh, museums especially love to hear these stories. So just wanted to say thank you for joining me, and um, this is a lovely image that I thought I would share.
Kim, I think you're muted. Thanks, Casey. We'll get you to stop sharing your screen there. Okay. Oh, thank you so much for taking the time to go into the collection for us and, and getting those photographs. I've not seen uh, most of those dolls before. So it's really interesting to have a sense of the variety and types because even when you mentioned a bisque doll, I couldn't quite picture what that was. So it was great to see, uh, to see them there. And thank you also for the very practical advice um, that you shared. I love the idea of framing paper dolls. They're so graphic and I think that would be lovely. I'm going to look into that. Um, well, thanks uh, for everyone for joining us and uh, both live and on Facebook. And for those folks who might be watching the recording, thank you for that. Uh, members and locals, you might be aware that the Royal BC Museum is getting to, ready to reopen on Friday, June the 19th. As a member of the staff, I'm thankful for those teams, including Casey, that have been working hard to ensure the safest conditions for our staff, volunteers, partners, and visitors to return. You can find out more about our reopening on our website. Uh, we will be, we'll also uh, have a sneak peek. So on Thursday, Friday, uh, sorry, on Thursday, June the 18th, on this, uh, at this time slot, we're gonna give you a little sneak peek of the uh, museum and what to expect. So join us there if you're curious and thinking about coming back. Uh, we will be continuing with our at home, at home kids and at outside programs for the foreseeable future and links for all of these programs will be posted on the Royal BC Museum's website. Next week is World Oceans Week and we're going to kick it off with the invertebrate collection manager Heidi Gartner, who will share the fascinating world of invertebrates with us. Thank you for including us in your screen time and keep taking care of yourselves and of your, yourselves and one another. Thanks, Casey. Bye-bye.